Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on the anti-cancer diet, putting the principles into practice. I'm Pamela Riggs, registered dietitian and outpatient nutrition coordinator at Marin Health Integrative Wellness Center. And I'm here with my wonderful, fabulous dietitian co-workers. We have Janine Vitali schultz and Julie Larner here today. And we're going to tag team this presentation. Um, so we're really happy to uh, be here today. Um, before we kind of get going here, I just wanted to remind those of you who are joining today to mute yourself if you're not already on mute, um, and that we are hopefully be able to answer some questions towards the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, if you wouldn't mind putting them in the chat box feature um, as we get to the end of the presentation, if we'd have a few minutes, we can pull a couple of those questions in and address those. If you have questions that we didn't get to, uh, you can feel free to email me um, after the presentation. My email address is pamela.riggs at mymarinhealth.org. So uh, one of us will get back to you um, to make sure that we do address any questions that you might have. Um, this presentation is being recorded today and I've been told that um, the recording will become available on the Marin Health YouTube channel. Um, there might be some uh, posting on our website as well. So look uh, forward to being able to share this to others who might not be able to get here today. All right, I think that's all of the reminders. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so basically today's presentation, we really wanna welcome everybody and provide really some you know, general overview of an anti-cancer diet, but more importantly, share the many health benefits of eating this way, as well as providing you guidance on how to adopt this lifestyle eating plan. It's one thing being able to lecture and tell people, you know, some great tips, but to be able to actually have you be able to walk away and go, oh yeah, I really learned something. So we're going to do this in a way that you'll get a little bit of a virtual shopping tour. So Janine and Julie are going to walk you through the different sections of the grocery store and um, give you some real uh, good tips in terms of what to look for and what to choose and, and navigate the store a little bit better if you need that. Um, we'll be sharing some healthy meal and snack ideas and some giving you some other practical tips and suggestions. And we even have a pre-recorded food demonstration for you on a, a nice plant-based uh, uh, meal to prepare. So got lots of things to talk about. Now, why are we here? I think as dietitians, obviously we believe in the benefit of eating well uh, for health, um, but certainly there is science to support that uh, anti-cancer healthful diet is gonna be something that may help reduce the risk of developing certain types of cancers or possibly preventing or delaying cancer progression for people who maybe have been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, there's data suggesting that one third of cancer deaths in the United States can be attributed to a poor diet and a sedentary lifestyle. And poor diet and sedentary lifestyle are also highly linked, right, to obesity. And we know that obesity uh, may worsen several aspects of cancer survivorship, um, quality of life, uh, cancer recurrence, uh, cancer progression, and prognosis. And for those of you who might be joining us that don't have cancer, are interested in preventing cancer, because that's the purpose of this presentation as well, to know that obviously good nutrition reduces the risk of developing other major chronic diseases. You know, we have uh, you know, an epidemic of obesity, diabetes in this country, and, you know, heart disease is one of the biggest killers of people, um, as well as high blood pressure. So we know that good nutrition, healthy eating and active lifestyle really helps reduce the risk of those conditions as well. So just overview of the benefits of an anti-cancer diet. Uh, again, if you have been diagnosed with cancer and you're going through treatment or recovery, certainly it's going to support recovery and healing as well as, you know, uh, making the quality of life uh, much better for you as you go through treatment and, and getting back into uh, your long-term health and wellness plan um, and certainly supports, you know, prevention of cancer and recurrence of cancers. 
If you're going through cancer treatment, certainly a good nutrition is going to help your body handle the stress of that cancer and the cancer therapies such as chemotherapy, surgery, um, radiation, uh, immunotherapies, all of those things. Certainly, we get an enhancement of a sense of well being when we eat well and take care of ourselves. And when it comes to energy and muscle mass and a healthy weight, obviously, an anti cancer diet and eating healthfully can help um, maintain all of those things, right? We want to feel our best, we want to be at a healthy weight so we can live our best lives and do the things that we enjoy with ease and comfort. And certainly an anti-cancer diet is for all of us. We're going to be talking about, you know, primarily a plant-based anti-inflammatory diet, and we can all benefit from eating this way. So we're excited to share the information today for you. Some general recommendations, and my colleagues will kind of go into more detail in these areas. But again, a good anti-cancer diet is going to be one that's predominantly plant-based. And I think you hear a lot of that term these days, plant-based diet, plant forward. Um, and we're not necessarily talking about a vegan diet or vegetarian diet per se, but something that is really based on a foundation of a lot of plant foods, your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains. So we want to strive to get our five servings or more of fruits and vegetables. We want to emphasize whole grains, 100% whole wheat, uh, bread, beans, legumes as a source of, you know, really healthy, complex carbohydrates and fiber. Uh, we want to consume healthy fats in moderation. So we'll talk more about that, as well as choose protein foods wisely. Certainly protein plays a really important role. If you're going through cancer treatment, we want to repair and heal, and you need protein for those things but we wanna make the best choices from that category. And certainly some other highlights on the right side of the screen here in terms of limiting red meat and processed meats that have been linked to things like colon cancer, um, limiting salt and charred and blackened foods, and certainly moderate to limiting alcohol. Alcohol um, has been linked specifically to breast cancer risk. And uh, we know that women who consume you know, more than you know, one, um, cocktail um, alcoholic beverage um, a day are at higher risk for breast cancer. So we really wanna limit that. And what does an anti-cancer plate look like, right? So what we're gonna be doing is taking you through the shopping sections of the store and helping you build a beautiful anti-cancer diet. And so this plate is a really good example. You'll see a lot of plant foods from tofu to beans to fruits and vegetables, lots of different colors, um, animal proteins. Again, uh, the good sources of omega-3 is coming from fish um, and maybe some organic uh, high in omega-3 eggs. And again, our whole grains, if we're choosing uh, breads and starches, healthy fats, um, and plenty of herbs and spices. And I think Julie's going to touch on that when we get to the grocery store tour. So obviously we can't eat well and prepare healthy food unless we have a very well-stocked kitchen. And so hopefully your refrigerator doesn't look like this one, which I think looks like it's got a couple liters of soda, maybe a beer or hot sauce, can't really tell, a lot of empty shelves. So the idea is to, you know, to make your grocery list, to get the items that you need so that when you're going to prepare the food, you have um, a well-stocked fridge to get started. All right, so I'm gonna now hand over the presentation to Janine, who's gonna start our shopping tour. So Janine, just let me know when you need okay. to advance the slides. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, so let's go shopping. Uh, this is an outline of your basic grocery store. I think um, Pam and I took most of these pictures at Molly Stone, so you might recognize some of them. But the main concept when we're going shopping, um, first, try not to be overly hungry, because we all know how tempting it can be if we go grocery shopping when we are starving. So try to eat before you go. And then really try to uh, shop the perimeter of the store first. OK, so shop the square for the freshest foods. Since we're talking about a plant-based diet as the, the healthy diet we're um, advocating based on lots of studies showing that people who eat the most plant foods have the best health outcomes, only makes sense to probably stop to start at the produce department, right? And then we'll work our way around the perimeter 
eventually get to those middle shelves um, where we have more of our prepared foods. There are so, also grains in the center of the store, um, you know, cleaning supplies, things we definitely need. But let's start off with produce so that we make sure we really get um, a good supply of fresh fruits and veggies. Next. Okay, so we are blessed to have such a wide array of plant foods, um, especially living in California and being in Marin County near Sonoma County. So, so many plant foods that we, we really have available to us. So I want you just to encourage you to try to um, try some new vegetables and fruits when you're at the store. Uh, some people, you know, it's, it's nice to eat seasonally. And again, here in um, uh, Marin and Sonoma County, I live in Sonoma County now, we have all these wonderful farmers markets. So you might actually be buying your plant foods at um, a seasonal farmers market. Um, there's also for those of us who are busy, there's some co-ops you could join where you get, you um, pay for a, uh, a basket or a box of fresh seasonal produce to be delivered to your house weekly. Um, we actually have it delivered to our office here every Friday. So there are wonderful ways that you can try to get into eating more plant foods. Next, Pam. Okay. So one, I think one of the easiest ways to challenge ourselves to eat a wide variety of plant foods is this concept of eating by the rainbow. Um, I think this was started with, with sort of just public health recommendations in mind. So the recommendation for all Americans is to eat five servings of plant foods per day. And when you get into the literature talking about cancer prevention, it's really more than that. Um, five to nine servings, eight to 10, various groups use different numbers, but the bottom line is more than five. And if you can get up to seven, eight, nine, or even 10 servings of plant foods per day, that's wonderful. So it can be somewhat challenging, at least initially. So I think this concept of eating by the rainbow is nice because you're going to get the benefit of all these different antioxidants, uh, phytochemicals, et cetera. Um, I think we, uh, we'll go to the, the phytochemical slide next, but I did want to, yeah, there it is. So you can see that all of our color rich fruits and vegetables um, do have phytonutrients or phytochemicals that we have named, you know, scientists have um, determined these specific compounds and named them, and they have all different sorts of health properties, um, tend to be anti-inflammatory, um, you know, protective of cell growth, etc. There's, you know, lists of these where you could actually get the functions from each plant food. But what I wanted to drive home here is you know, most of us don't want to memorize chemical names. Um, you know, in, we don't need to, right? We don't need to know that an allyl sulfide is what's in the white and green um, uh, allium uh, onions and garlic and chives, etc. What we really just need to challenge ourselves to do is to eat by the rainbow again, get a nice wide variety of our fruits and vegetables. Some of the benefits of these plant foods are um, that they are high in fiber, okay, which we know has all kinds of good health benefits, everything from bowel uh, preventing constipation to helping escort substances out of our, our GI tract. Um, plant foods are also lower in calories. So if you're eating a plant-based diet, you're going to be eating less fat, less animal foods. You're going to get more satiety or feel full from those plant foods. So it can really help with weight control. And sometimes after cancer treatment, weight um, control is an issue. So um, even if you couldn't eat maybe this vast variety, variety of plant foods during treatment, maybe you had some GI side effects um, and you had to be on a lower fiber diet short term. Once you're done with treatment during survivorship, you really can embrace these plant foods and it might also help control, control one's um, weight. Okay, so herbs, of course, are uh, plants, as we all know, and I think most of us think of them from a culinary perspective, you know, they make our taste, our food taste good. Um, fresh herbs play a wonderful role in, in cooking just so we can enhance the, the desire to eat um, the plant foods, but I looked up some of the characteristics of some of our common herbs and I wanted to share that with you. So basil our wonderful Italian our herb that's um, notable in Italian foods um, is anti-inflammatory. 
So basil has been thought to help with pain relief, right? Because it's an anti-inflammatory uh, plant. Mint helps soothe the, soothe the stomach. So any kinds of GI issues, whether it's indigestions, bloating, um, a nice cup of mint tea can help. Oregano is a very pow powerful antioxidant and antibacterial uh, herb. And I know in um, my, my granddaughter is raising chickens and they actually recommend putting dried oregano in the chicken feed as an, a natural antibacterial uh, substance so that you really don't have to treat those chickens with chemicals, you could do it naturally. Uh, parsley is a really good source of folic acid. So it plays a nice role in heart health. And rosemary contains a compound car called car carnosic acid, and it may protect against retinal damage, so therefore um, improves eye health. So again, some of us like to know sort of the scientific um, side of these phytochemicals, others just um, knowing that they're good and healthy for us and having that rainbow in our mind when we're shopping um, can really help guide us towards eating more of those plant foods. So when we get into choosing our foods, the question comes up, should I buy organic or not? And with prices increasing, it becomes more of a question, you know, as, fine, as our, we are maybe strained a little more financially. Um, so one of the, the tools I really love is from the Environmental Working Group's website. Um, the next slide we'll, we'll get to will show you that website. But EWG, or Environmental Working Group, has some notoriety from um, the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. You may have heard that on the news or just a little soundbite on the radio. So they're a consumer advocacy group and they're really trying to help consumers make wise choices. And so in terms of um, produce, what they've come up with yearly is this list of the, the Dirty Dozen or the 12 fruits and vegetables that have the most chemical residue. So the most herbicide and pesticide residue. So what they're suggesting is this is where we actually spend our organic dollar in the produce aisle. And then the clean 15 are those 15 plant foods that traditional farming methods are such that they really don't need to spray. And so you can feel comfortable buying um, conventional or non-organic produce for the clean 15. And so I think that's really helpful because, you know, when we go through the store, sometimes we do need to make those choices. And as you'll see, when we get into the animal proteins, um, it really is suggested that we buy clean, organic animal proteins. So sometimes saving some money in the produce aisle can allow us to buy that organic chicken versus the, the standard. Um, the next slide shows uh, the website. So it's ewg.org. And they've got this really neat app. It's called the Healthy Living app. So you could go to the app store and download uh, EWG's Healthy Living app. And what it does is it allows you to scan the barcode on any sort of um, packaged, I mean, anything that has a barcode in the store. So anything from cleaning supplies, shampoo, makeup, um, packaged foods. And what it does is it allows you, allows the consumer easily to find out if there's something in that product that um, they're concerned about. So there are chemicals that we, um, that the United States has banned, and then the European Union actually has more banned chemicals. So when you're getting into things like cleaning supplies or sunscreens, it can be somewhat difficult to know if you're falling prey to marketing, you know, if all those healthy looking labels really imply it's a healthier product or if, if it's something you should spend your money on. So that's a wonderful app and um, their website, even if you don't wanna download the app and you just go to their website, they've got the, the Dirty Dozen list and all kinds of other good consumer um, shopping ideas. Okay. So the next session, section is our animal proteins, okay? So here at Molly Stones, it was our meat and our seafood. And as Pam said earlier, um, we don't need to be vegans to adopt a healthy plant-based diet, okay? That's a common misconception I hear from a lot of, of um, people I meet with. We know a vegan or a vegetarian diet is super healthy, but the data does not say we all have to be vegans. What it says is we need to eat more plant foods. And so we just went through that. Remember that the picture of the plate, half of our plate should be covered with plant foods, right? Primarily vegetables, the rest fruits. 
Um, and then a quarter of the plate would be our proteins. Okay. So for those of us who are still eating animal proteins, we really need to learn how to choose those animal proteins wisely. And again, remember it's a quarter of the plate. So we're not recommending a huge T-bone steak with a little, <laughs> a little dollop of frozen peas and mashed potatoes, right? We're talking about a quarter portion of a nice healthy protein. So what could that be? Um, when we talk about red meat, we're really referring to beef, pork, and lamb. And there is data that suggests that those, we really should decrease incidence of those red meats. Okay, so um, Pam, I wanna go back one slide. I just wanna sure. alert them to that, the study. There we go. So at the bottom of the page, you'll see um, a link to a really good study. So if you want more definitive information about animal proteins and cancer risk. I would, I would suggest you jot this down while I'm talking. Um, so the OSHA Center, the OSHA Integrative Center at UCSF is a really um, great uh, site. It's another integrative uh, medicine um, practice and they have some really good articles. And so I found this one on animal proteins and cancer risk. And they go through, through it's, it's quite lengthy. They go through um, various types of cancer and all of the different animal proteins, and they'll give you the specific um, recommendations for a specific type of cancer. So it's not the same one size fits all. Um, I'll, I'll touch upon that, but it's much too detailed to go into in this hour presentation. So I do want to refer you to that, that link. Um, okay, so red meat we were talking about. Um, there is data that suggests that high intake of red meat is associated um, with an increased risk of getting colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. Um, and so because of those, that risk, the recommendations really are to, to eat less red meat. Um, I've read various varying amounts. I think the strictest recommendation I've seen from one of the agencies is not more than 10 ounces of red meat per week. Um, I, in, in other literature, I saw a bit higher, but I think 10 ounces is a, good, is a good number to keep in our mind. So if you're thinking of a nice three ounce portion, which is the size of um, your basic hamburger patty, that would be three servings of red meat per week, okay, to get to your nine or, or 10 ounces. So you really need to choose that red meat carefully. And the suggestion is to buy the grass fed and organic if you really are feeling the need for some red meat, okay? Um, we know that grass fed animals have more omega-3 fats, which are more anti-inflammatory. So the cow out grazing and eating grass as opposed to the one um, in a feedlot eating corn is gonna have a healthier fat profile, okay? The data doesn't totally um, support this because we don't, we didn't collect that data for the last 50 years. You know, when we looked at how much red meat people ate, we weren't asking what the cow ate. <laughs> but the, the, the hypothesis is that red meat is going to be much, um, I mean, grass fed is going to be much uh, healthier. I'm sorry, I have to log in here for some reason. I lost my screen. There we go. I'm back. Okay. Um, and uh, again, with the red meat, um, there is a recommendation to really avoid processed preserved meats, okay? Smoked, salted, processed, preserved. So we're talking about our luncheon meats, our sausage, bacon, bologna, salami, all of those. Um, there's many hypotheses about what could be the harm in red meat. And again, that article goes into it in great depth. Everything from the heme, heme iron, um, to the saturated fat content, the cholesterol content, and then cooking meat at a high temperature creates carcinogens. So if you do um, desire red meat or even poultry occasionally, make sure it's not charred and blackened. Okay, that's an important thing. So if you're going to barbecue, you want to marinate it first and make sure it doesn't get charred and blackened. But back to the processed meats, the food industry has caught on that um, uh, consumers are trying to avoid the, the preservatives in meat. So there are um, companies now like Applegate Farms, Columbus. I've even seen some from the food, big food um, or big meat industry like Hormel. It will say no preservatives, no nitrates, no nitrites. So if you are gonna select a little bit of red meat um, for that 10 ounce limit and you wanted some ham, um, 
you would want to get the one that said um, uncured, no nitrates, no nitrates. Okay, so that's just a, a good shopping tip to keep in mind. But predominantly, we should be eating more fish and more poultry as our animal proteins and then um, free range eggs. So with fish, you'll want to look for wild as opposed to farmed. And those that are high in omega threes, we'll talk about in a moment. Um, here again, being close to the Bay uh, or close to the Pacific Ocean, we can get good wild salmon. There is concern about the, um, the farmed Atlantic salmon. So I would encourage you to try to get the, the wild. And if you've got it at a good price, put it in the freezer. Same thing with the poultry, get the organic free range chicken. And same with eggs, okay? Next. This shows the omega-3 content of um, common seafoods. Okay, so we're basically, we're talking about our fattier fish. Um, so again, I'll steer you to the wild salmon as opposed to the farmed. Um, herring, which isn't a real popular fish, but it does have a really good omega-3 content. And then there's also um, tuna, mackerel, and sardines. And keep in mind that salmon, sardines, and herring are high in omega-3s as noted, but they're also lower in mercury than tuna. So we don't want to overdo our tuna intake. Um, I think the recommendation is not more than two servings a week for most people. For children and pregnant women, it's less. The article I was referring to you has a nice um, link to a seafood site. Um, that talks about the, the mercury risk associated with certain seafoods, gives you a guideline on how much seafood or how much uh, of various fish that does contain mercury, how much based on your body weight. And then it also links you to some of the environmental issues with seafood in our farming practices. So again, complex topic. Um, but the recommendation is for most of us to eat seafood twice a week if we enjoy seafood. And then I would say lean um, poultry. Um, if you cook your chicken with the skin on, um, which I've learned to do uh, when my husband barbecues, because I used to put on these lovely chicken breasts, skinless chicken breasts, and they just got dry and charred. So the, 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 the skin can act as a little barrier, it keeps in moisture, and then just peel off the skin and don't eat it at the time. Um, when you sit down and, and plate up your meal. Okay, next Pam. So remember there's plenty of plant-based proteins and that's really the challenge for all of us. You know, again, plant-based doesn't mean, mean vegetarian, but I think we should all strive to have more vegetarian meals, right? So um, if, if it's a new thing for you and your family, maybe you try one, you know, a meatless Monday. Every Monday you make something that's completely plant-based. And then go from there. You know, you might find some good recipes. Um, it's fall is here. So getting out the crock pot or the Instapot and making some wonderful soups or um, vegetarian chili, et cetera. Pam is gonna make a wonderful lentil soup at the end of this. So keep in mind, we get just as much protein. Um, we get good amounts of protein from our plant-based proteins. And as long as um, you, you, the strict rule of combining proteins isn't what it, what we used to think it was. As long as you are um, eating a variety of proteins throughout the day, you're most likely gonna get complete proteins. If you are a vegan, then you know that's something you might pay a little more attention to. Um, but in general, um, nuts and seeds and whole grains, things like quinoa, which is a seed, um, those all provide adequate and good amounts of proteins. And let's not forget our soy products. Okay, so I will just touch upon soy quickly. Um, there has been a lot of controversy about soy foods and breast cancer, maybe over the last 15, 20 years. The bottom line is the data has been reanalyzed and even women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers can consume and enjoy traditional soy foods. A serving per day is, is usually what's recommended. And what I mean by traditional is edamame, tofu, tempeh, um, not the processed soy foods and the extracts because we just don't have uh, the, enough data on those, but the traditional soy foods definitely have a place in, in all of our diets. Next. Okay, another hot topic, dairy. <laughs> okay, so when I said one size does not fit all, I meant it. <laughs> so dairy is one of those um, topics that's very controversial. Some people are 
um, pro dairy, some are anti, you could go online and go crazy with all the different advice you're gonna get. But, but looking at the science and looking at a cancer prevention diet, the data really is mixed. Um, so in summary of that article I refer to, um, dairy is thought to be somewhat protective or meaning it might help decrease risk of breast cancer and colorectal cancer, okay? Um, however, other cancers like prostate cancer, there's concern that uh, too much dairy consumption could increase risk. So you can see there's a, a lot we need to learn about dairy, um, the mechanisms by which it could do such different things with different cancers is still ongoing. Um, there are definitely, um, so many other dairy alternatives that we'll see in a second that you don't need to consume dairy. But if you do like dairy, what I would recommend is getting organic, okay? That is one food that I think we feel pretty strongly about buying organic. Um, there's just concern about hormones and antibiotics in, um, in uh, conventional dairy. And then also what the cows are eating, right? Back to that, if it's grass-fed milk, those cows have more omega-3 in their fats versus um, a, a feedlot cow that's eating primarily corn, which produces um, more of an inflammatory response. Julie will get a little bit more into that, I think. Um, okay, next slide, Pam. So there are so many choices in the dairy world, right? You go down the aisle of Molly Stones or whatever store you shop at, and it's just overwhelming. I think this has expanded in the last 10 years. Um, so many milk-like alternatives, right? So um, you really have to kind of base it on your nutritional needs and your preferences. So there's the cow milk, soy, almond, coconut, et cetera. Um, if you are lactose intolerant or you just are on a, a non-dairy milk uh, or diet, it's really nice that there are so many alternatives because there are a lot of, of good good substitutes now. And one good thing to keep in mind is that they do, um, they are calcium fortified. So most of these products are going to give you at least as much calcium as cow milk, if not more. Um, and then of course, we've got all our yogurts and kefir in this aisle. So Pam, maybe the next slide would be good. Okay. So I just wanted to quickly compare um, the nutrients in milk. And the main point I wanted to make here is that some of the plant-based milk alternatives are not good sources of protein, okay? So if you um, enjoy rice milk or um, oat milk, almond milk, that's fine, but just know that they're not giving you much protein. They maybe are giving you a gram or two, okay, per serving. Um, so sometimes during cancer treatment, we're talking about consuming more protein and uh, there's other ways definitely to get that protein in, but just take a look at your milk product and see how much um, protein you're getting from it. And then also how much calcium. Okay. Like I said, most of them are excellent sources of calcium. Now um, the percent daily value that's based on 1000 milligrams. So this would represent 330 milligrams of calcium coming from cow milk, um, et cetera. So I'm not sure if this is the most up-to-date slide. I think even the rice and the coconut are probably now fortified. So look at your wide variety of milk-like products and decide um, what fits your needs. Um, carbohydrate content is less in the plant-based um, milk alternatives, but there is a new cow milk. Um, I don't think I have a picture of it, but it's an ultra-filtered milk. It's um, one of the brand names is Fairlife. And then I've seen other, other brands, but Fairlife is ultra filtered cow milk, which has higher amounts of protein. I think it's 14 grams of protein per serving versus eight, has less carbohydrate and it's lactose free. So that's sort of a neat new product. Um, there's always been lactate milk or a lactose reduced milk, which is good for people with lactose intolerance, but this Fairlife is nice in that it's also lower carb, higher protein and Costco does have it. <laughs> so it might be something that you'll check out um, at any of the stores. Okay, and then we get into our yogurts and our kefir, and keep in mind, those are wonderful sources of probiotics. Okay, so probiotics are those healthy bacteria that can help keep our gut nice and healthy, um, balances our microflora, 
Um, and we're learning a lot more about um, our microbiome or these healthy bacteria that live in our body. Um, so whereas, whereas we normally, we used to think of probiotics as really gut healthy, we now know that they're really healthy for the body in general, okay? It's gonna help the immune system, help keep um, our, our gut barrier uh, protective. So there's a lot and a lot of data going on about probiotics and just general health benefits. So keep in mind our yogurt and kefir are really good options. I should note that kefir is usually pretty much lactose-free. Most of the cartons say 99% lactose-free because it is fermented and that lactose has been um, reduced. Um, and Greek yogurt is one of my favorites. Not so much for, it does have probiotics, but it's also higher protein, lower carbohydrate than other yogurts. So um, just to backtrack a little bit with yogurt, keep in mind the sugar content on a sweetened yogurt can be extremely high. So our usual recommendation is to go with the unsweetened yogurt, whether it's Greek or conventional, and then add your fresh fruit to it yourself. And if you really need a sweet taste, you could add a little stevia, a little monk fruit, stir that in. You could even add a little vanilla extract. Um, but a lot of the sweetened yogurt, you'll be shocked by how much sugar has been added in that jam that's at the bottom. So keep in mind um, for added sugars, we're trying to say not more than 26 grams per day. And that helps when you're looking at your yogurt. Other sources of probiotics uh, would be um, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso soup, um, kombucha, a fermented drink, and then of course the kefir and the yogurt. So um, in most cases, having a food rich probiotic per day will do the trick. If you feel you need more than that, that's something you can also reach out just to discuss whether your, your health um, concerns are such that you might need an actual probiotic supplement. And that's, we're three quarter or a quarter of the way through the shopping, the grocery store. So I'm going to turn it over to Julie now. Julie, you're muted here. There you go. No. There you Hi, go. everybody. Thanks, Janine. <laughs> so we've reached the bread and whole grain stop of the grocery tour. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite stops. And mm -hmm. I... This is an interesting one because I think bread and whole grains have really been having trouble with their image lately. People are wondering, should they even eat these things? Are, are, are these foods bad to eat? Will they make me gain weight? Um, shouldn't I just avoid this section altogether? I'm happy to report that, that the answer is no. Actually, carbohydrate, which bread and whole grains are made up of, is the preferred source of fuel for the brain and muscles. Carbohydrate is a very important nutrient that we all need. And in fact, if for some reason you cut out all of the carbohydrate you would might eat, um, your body would does not care what your personal goals are and it would break down uh, your muscle and other do other ways to get the same nutrient that it wants. Um, when it comes to selecting bread and whole grains, the really important thing to remember is that most of the time you wanna choose what we call whole grains. And the reason for that is that that a whole grain tends to have all of the fiber, protein, B vitamins, minerals, all of the things um, that really benefit your body. So it gives you, like I was saying, the fuel for your cells, but it also gives you all of these added um, nutrients that helps your body function well. So you can see in this slide, the reason white bread is white bread is because in the manufacturing process, they take out all of those nutrients. Um, and it, it, the product is a very nice white bread, but you're kind of leaving a lot of the nutrition behind um, during that process. I do want to point out too, that we're not just talking about bread. There's a number of really delicious whole grains and kind of back to what um, Janine was talking, I think it was Janine, um, you know, many of these grains are high in protein and fiber. So you can, you know, if especially if you're eating less meat, you can uh, make up for some of those areas by eating more whole grains. And um, I'm not gonna read them off for you, but you can see the list here. Um, kind of like with the vegetables, it's not a bad idea to try a new one. Google a millet recipe. See if you like millet. Um, you might find it's your new favorite grain. Um, and I definitely mixing up different kinds of grains is always gonna be a good idea. 
All right. So again, uh, we've really stressed that the perimeter of the store is probably where you want to start for all of the good reasons that were, have already come up. I also want to point out that, you know, the center of the store, you'll start to see when you look at the back of your food labels, you'll start to see more and more ingredients. And I think that's part of what we're concerned about when we get to those center aisles. So I think this picture is showing a, some Raisin Bran. If you love Raisin Bran and it makes you feel happy and like, makes your life complete. That's great. But you want to remember the 80-20 rule, okay? And have with your bowl of raisin bran, make sure you're doing what Janine said and add fruit and, you know, vegetables and or whatever you need to add to each meal to kind of round it out. Um, but don't feel that you can never buy raisin bran. Just remember it's some of these foods are sometimes foods and we want to stick to being as unprocessed as we can. And actually, if I can, one quick thing, sorry to backtrack, but I'd forgotten to mention when you're buying bread in particular, um, there are, you've probably noticed many, many, many options right now. And that's fantastic that we have so much choice. But when you're looking at that food label, again, a good way to kind of quickly make a decision is look for the higher protein per serving, look for the higher fiber per serving. So if you have two and they both look good to you, Look for the fiber and the protein number and grab that higher one. That's a good rule of thumb. Thank you for going back. I didn't want to skip that. Um, and then we get to the healthy fats and oils. So again, much like breads and grains and carbohydrates, people worry about fat. Isn't low fat better? Shouldn't we eat as little fat as possible? So really it's more nuanced than that. What we've found is that there are certain kinds of fats that are more detrimental to health than others. And there are certain fats that are actually heart protective and are really important for a healthy diet. And in fact, believe it or not, you can actually have an essential fatty acid deficiency if you really eat zero fat. So really, if we can stress anything to you as dietitians, it's remember that all of these foods play a role in a healthy diet. And, you know, it's really about balance and making sure you get a little of everything. Okay. So what are healthy fats? Um, one big one that we love in California, especially are avocados. This is a great one. Um, it's full of fiber as well as healthy fats. So it's a great choice for salads or a snack or anything that you um, might wanna use an avocado for. And then there's an array of really um, healthy nuts and oils. And those again are full, they're anti-inflammatory, full of omega-3s and just a great way to round out a meal, especially given that oils um, and nuts they are very high in calories, but that helps with your satiety, okay? And the, and the protein as well. So having, having a little of this item will make you feel fuller and then round out your meal nicely. Um, I did wanna say as a corollary to that, these are higher calorie foods. So you don't have to um, be concerned about really strictly limiting, but just keep in mind that these are foods that are calorie dense. So if you are trying to maintain weight, you just want to make sure that you're, you're judicious about how much you're using those. And then I just want to show you this slide. I'm not expecting anyone to memorize this, but what I wanted to really show you here is that monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fats, those are the fats we really want you to focus on in your diet. Um, you'll note there that the hazelnut, olive, almond at the bottom there, those are the oils that we kind of want you to lean into more. And as we go higher up the list, it just becomes more saturated fat and a little less healthful. Um, kind of like we've been saying the whole time, occasional, if you want to use some of these higher saturated fat oils, that's, that's fine. But if you're looking at, what do I do most of the time? I would tend toward the bottom of this list. And then the other thing I really wanted to call your attention to is that the oil in this list with the most saturated fat is coconut oil. And you may have heard, there's a lot of talk about coconut oil and its magical mystical properties. And it is really, you know, it's a, it's a great oil. It's good to cook with at high heat and, you know, topically it's antimicrobial. There's a lot of good things to say about coconut oil, 
but I just want to stress it's it's high in saturated fat. So, you know, enjoy it, use it, but it's probably not the oil you want to use the most. So that's what I have to say about that. And then this is another sort of, again, we're talking about, you know, you can definitely have red meat, butter, cheese, ice cream, those things. But that's, again, you want to keep those to sometimes foods because of the saturated fat content. Um, we used to warn about trans fats. Honestly, they are not in many foods anymore. Um, they've been sort of drummed out of the, out of the processed food world. But for sure, you want to avoid trans fats and limit saturated fats. And then lean into these other healthy fats, um, the nuts, fatty fish, salmon, tuna, you know, those healthy vegetable oils. And then spices and tea. So basically this is a bit like what Janine was talking about with her fresh herbs. So these are items that have lots of phytonutrients and polyphenols. They're really helpful in, you know, um, they provide antioxidant properties and kind of keep keep everything you know humming nicely. But the other reason I really like spices in particular is that some of us are salt sensitive, and many of us eat too much salt. So spices are a great way to really pep up your food without adding more salt to try to get kind of turn up the flavor. Um, and spices are one that I would recommend organic if you can if it fits your budget because spices do tend to be a little bit more, the, the process of um, manufacture just tends to be a little um, not clean. Yeah, I try to avoid the clean word, but it's all I could really think to say in this regard. So I would, if you can afford it, I'd go for the organic um, when it comes to spices. Um, and then now we'll just talk about a couple individual items. So you may have heard about turmeric and curry. Both of these are really great um, for their anti-inflammatory um, aspects, but also, you know, specifically with cancer, there's a good amount of evidence that they help, um, you know, their anti-cancer properties are um, notable and that it really helps your body in terms of inflammation as a whole. Um, what's interesting about turmeric too, and, and if I can briefly touch on this, sometimes people think, a little of something means I should do a lot. And this is an example where, you know, you, you can buy turmeric supplements and that's something you might do at some season of life when you really felt like you wanted to, to have a lot of this um, ingredient in your life. But keep in mind that absorption ultimately is gonna be better when you're eating it with food. Um, it's gonna digest better and it's more bioavailable. And along those lines, here's a little um, kind of a recipe, but if you want to use turmeric powder, you'll always want to put olive oil and black pepper to sort of help with that absorption. Um, and again, it's always better to get these items from food when you can and, and not go straight to the supplement. Um, and then green tea is another one. Lots of studies showing benefit in green tea. Um, again, I won't read off the whole list, but it's again, a powerful antioxidant and has lots of anti-cancer properties. Most of it is caffeinated. So do pay attention to that. If you are sensitive to caffeine um, or you enjoy coffee in the morning and you wanna have green tea later in the day, just make sure it's decaffeinated and you'll still get some of the polyphenols and, and the good stuff in those. So, and then here it just talks about making sure to steep your green tea, which makes sense. And you want to drink it quickly enough that, you know, the benefits are still are still there. Yeah. And then I just wanted to take a moment and, you know, let you guys know that we presented a lot of information here and it's evidence based and it's great and you should incorporate as much of it as you can. But you also the last thing we want is to overwhelm or to make you feel like, oh, this is just too much. I, I have a full-time job. I can't also do all of these things. And just remember that you're, you know, any steps that you take towards these habits are great steps. And every day is a new day and you can each day say, what vegetable are you gonna eat today? Am I gonna try that millet recipe? You know, and try to be nice to yourself because another part of health, right, is making sure that you're, taking care of yourself and that you're 
and you're basically not beating yourself up for not eating the right way. Okay. Um, and this uh, is a quote. Um, this uh, author is Jenny Rosenstrock, and she has done a number of cookbooks. But essentially, this quote that she has boiled down is, don't forget, you know, food is fuel, food is medicine, food is all of these things. But it's also, you know, it's our um, spice of life. It's what we do with our families. It's part of our culture. So this is, you know, ultimately remember that food is to be celebrated and it's a joy and that we should never forget that when we're eating. Also, just as a quick aside, Jenny Rosenstrock has a great new book called Weekday Vegetarians, which fits in pretty nicely with what we've been talking about. She wrote it from the perspective of a family that thought, we like meat, we're going to keep eating meat, but we'd like to eat more plant-based meals. And so she kind of talks about how to do that, you know, switch and how to take recipes you might love and make them a little more meatless. So something to check in on if, you, if that sounds interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, that was that's inspiring to know that uh, that cookbook's out there too that give you some nice suggestions. So, as Julie said, um, you know, bringing this back to what you're going to do every day, we try to give you a, a real snapshot overview of the science. And let's just talk about a typical day and what we could uh, some choices we can make that would make our meals healthier. Um, try a smoothie. Smoothies are one of my favorite go-tos. Uh, they're a great way to condense all those fruits and vegetables we're trying to get into our diet in a nice uh, drink that you could bring to work with you, drink in the car, um, have while you're running errands. Um, my one suggestion with smoothies is make sure they're balanced. So you want protein, fat, and carbohydrates and fiber all in there. Um, we've got lots of good recipes. Um, there's tons online, but basically um, do make sure that you have a protein source, whether it's Greek yogurt or a protein powder. Um, the fruits and the veggies are easy for the carbohydrates and fiber. And sometimes the fat's a little challenging, but you could throw in an avocado, you could throw in some uh, nuts, or you could um, use a, a higher fat, like a, a higher fat yogurt, etc. Okay, so lots of good recipes there. Even a little coconut, full fat coconut milk could work. Overnight oats is another great thing. So instead of buying the instant oats that have a lot of, you know, the little packets with the brown sugar, cinnamon and all that in there, those are a lot of sugar. So you could make your own with uh, traditional oats or steel cut oats and by soaking them overnight with the liquid and some spices and fruit um, in the morning, they're ready to go. You could eat it cold or just microwave it real quick in that mason jar and eat it, um, you know, right before you head out the door or even, you know, take it to work with you. Uh, veggie scrambles, egg scrambles can be wonderful ways to get more plant foods in. You could really extend that egg and do less egg and more, more vegetable. Um, you could throw in some tofu too, right? And then avocado toast has gotten very popular lately, <laughs> but it's a really nice food. So if you're tired of peanut butter on your whole grain toast, try some avocado. Um, it's a nice way to get uh, a nice satisfying meal, but with all those good healthy nutrients from the avocado. And then remember to hydrate in the morning. That's something I have to tell myself all the time. Um, we really, um, it's important to not run on a, a dehydrated mode. <laughs> okay, so sometimes in the morning while you're making that cup of coffee, you might actually drink a cup of water while you're waiting for the coffee to brew, just as a way to make sure that you are starting your day hydrated. It could be cold water, warm tea, whatever works for you. Okay, next, Pam. Lunch can be an obstacle for those who are working or going to school. So again, um, try to think ahead of some, maybe some new ideas. Um, you know, there's uh, for kids meals, there's the nice little boxes where you can have it all prepped the night before. And, you know, this one looks so cute. I'm sure your child would actually eat all those foods. Um, you know, sometimes that apple that's in every lunch bag never gets consumed. <laughs> and I've unfortunately seen it in school lunch rooms that the giveaway pile just has, you know, um, a bucket full of apples and oranges in it. So just taking the time to cut up the fruit might actually inspire your kid to eat it or putting in the berries. Um, keep in mind, there's a lot of things we can do 
without the lunch meat ideas, right? You can make wraps, you can get that um, preservative free turkey for uh, a healthy sandwich. Um, you can make more of a veggie based one, avocado, cream cheese, you know, sliced tomato, et cetera. Um, and also when you're working, same thing, try to bring your food with you if you're in an, uh, a work situation where you just don't have access to food and you're tempted to eat out too often or um, skip eating altogether. Many people just don't eat at lunch and then they're not feeling as energetic as they should. And by the time they go home, they're ravenous. Um, mason jars can be a really nice way to pack things. I'm from the Tupperware generation, but I'm really tired of Tupperware because I never can find the lid that fits it. And my daughter-in-law turned me on to, to mason jars, which is so silly. It's a, such an old fashioned idea, but it is clean and safe and you can actually microwave in it, just take that lid off. So, um, I think that can be, they bring, you know, my son brings mason jars of leftovers to work every day. Okay, and don't, you know, don't make yourself feel that you can't get frozen or packaged vegetables. Okay, what I wanted to say on that is frozen vegetables are actually super healthy because they're frozen right out of the field. So um, they have a role. Um, and also the pre-washed lettuces, okay? Because sometimes we can, you know, buy all this fresh produce and then never get around to cleaning it and it just spoils in our, in our uh, produce drawer. So it's okay to make life a little easier and get the pre-chopped butternut squash, get the lettuce, et cetera. Pam, next for dinner. Prepare ahead when you have time and energy. So that might mean on the weekend, you um, kind of think through what you're gonna have for the week, get out that crock pot, the Instapot. Um, some people are really into the, the, meal, uh, the meal delivery options like, um, what are they called? Simply Fresh. And, um, you know, if that works for you, great. Um, you might try it and then realize that you could do a lot of that on your own with just a little, a little preparation on the weekend and um, save some money. But then there's also um, meal services. So if anyone is under cancer treatment or having a health issue series, Healing Meals through the Series Community Project is a wonderful program. We have a lot of um, patients when they're under active therapy, they get these healthy organic meals from series and they are actually available for purchase after. Um, so if it's something you've really learned and you've loved it, but you are now luckily done with treatment, you can still continue the service. So there are some um, really good avenues out there um, if you, you know, want to purchase prepared meals. Next. And this is just a real quick little review of uh, something simple we could all do, right? So you go into the grocery store, it's late, you're tired, um, you know that, you know, your loved ones are at home and they're hungry. So maybe you get that organic rotisserie chicken, okay? And first night, that's what you're going to have. You call ahead and ask your, your partner to, you know, put on some brown rice or some quinoa to cook and you have salad, quinoa, and chicken that first night, okay? And then tomorrow, maybe you can make it into soft tacos, right? Um, maybe you can also, you know, make it into a cacciatore or a soup or a, a hearty uh, chicken salad sandwich the next day. So, you know, be nice to yourself, like Julie said, everything does not have to be made from scratch, um, just starting with some healthy ingredients and then a little imagination and planning. You can have some really healthy meals um, based on, you know, something as simple as this organic rotisserie chicken. Pam? Um, healthy snacks. So again, most of us do better when we um, feed ourselves. <laughs> okay, so if you're at work going all day without eating, challenge yourself to bring some healthy snacks. Even if you don't feel like you are going to eat a whole lunch meal, have some healthy food available. It could be as easy as some cottage cheese and fruit or a yogurt, some apples and almond butter. Maybe you made a smoothie in the morning, you bring that with you. And then there's all kinds of really healthy bars out there. Um, Kind bars, for example, are our favorite around here. Um, you know, nuts and seeds with just a little bit of sweetener. Um, so have some healthy snacks available, whether it's at work, um, at the home office, or in the car when you're traveling or going on a trip. It really can save you from um, getting that ravenous uh, 
feeling where you're just ready to stop at any fast food restaurant because you need food, right? So a little planning ahead, and I'm speaking to myself, can really help um, you keep on track with a healthy diet and feel better. And this is just a snapshot of an anti-cancer day. I think for sake of time, I, I'm not going to read it. Um, but keep in mind that goal of at least five, ideally seven or eight servings of plant foods per day, you can see that with some um, just some forethought, you can get to that goal. And um, having a plant food at every meal is definitely a good initial goal. Um, and then just keep in mind with the desserts, um, we don't have to go dessert free, but we really should choose lower sugar desserts. So instead of making snickerdoodles or sugar cookies, try to make a really dense oatmeal, um, dark chocolate chip walnut cookie, and maybe you throw in some ground flaxseed. And the other little trick with the desserts is eat a small portion right after your meal, because if that carbohydrate is digested with the protein, fat, and fiber, um, your blood sugar control is going to be better. So you're not going to have that glycemic spike, which leads to more insulin production and other health consequences. So a little snack, a little sweet treat at the end of dinner or end of lunch is much better than having it hours later on an empty stomach when your willpower has gone, um, <laughs> has evaporated. Okay. And then if you need a healthy snack later in the day, make it a savory balanced one. All right. So Pam. Thank you guys so much. We're obviously overloading everybody with a lot of great information. So we're almost uh, getting through the presentation. We have a few more things to cover. And I just want to throw in a couple more practical ideas. Um, you know, I think sometimes we get tired of eating the same thing. We're kind of bored and we lose our motivation to kind of make healthy uh, food for ourselves. So treat yourself to a new cookbook, um, a health conscious magazine, um, there's so many good resources for online recipes. Um, there's some really great ones that I love. Um, there is a, a website called Oshi oh Glows, uh, wonderful vegetarian uh, meal and recipe ideas. And I have a cookbook um, of that person who, who authored that um, book uh, that I, I use all the time and everything I've made has been delicious. Um, Lemon, someone, uh, a patient of mine told me about, I think it's Love and Lemons is another uh, vegetarian website, great recipes. Um, and then again, you know, there may be some cooking classes that you can do online, um, but the idea is just to, to be creative and to, you know, look for new ideas. And it's not like you have to make something new all the time, like just pick one recipe, do one thing and maybe a week um, you get your recipe, you look through the ingredients, you make your shopping list, and then you go to the store and get what you need. So, um, and, you know, sometimes you can double up on a recipe. And so you have enough that you can maybe put some in the freezer for the next time um, to save a little bit of time afterwards um, and make, you know, a little bit more so that you have leftovers. So really making good use of the time when you do uh, take the time to, to cook and experiment with a new recipe. If you're just too busy to do that work, you know what? It's okay if you have to do takeout or get something um, uh, from the store that's already pre-made. Um, just really trying to ask for what you need in restaurants, sauces on the side, replacing you know a, a French fries with a side salad. Again, just being mindful about um, the options that you have when you go to eat out. And like Julie said, always remember that 80-20 rule. We're not about being perfect here. Um, we want to eat healthfully most of the time, but also enjoy our food, celebrate with food, um, and eat it very mindfully. Um, and again, if we're doing the really good things for ourselves, you know, 80% of the time, I think we all can be really happy with that um, balance of still enjoying food for all that it is, um, as well as getting your nutritional needs met. So speaking of recipes um, and plant-based foods, uh, I pre-recorded a little food demonstration of preparing uh, red lentil soup, which is one of my favorite soups. I make this probably twice a month at least. Um, my husband and I love it. It's super easy and delicious. And so I'm gonna show you this video. The video is about seven and a half minutes. So hang in there with us and we're almost uh, through the rest of this presentation. So let's get this going. I'm Mr. Dai Chin at Men's Health and Creative Wellness Center. Yay. Today. <laughs> Good job, Thank Julie. One of my favorite soup recipes. 
red lentil soup. And it's a great recipe. It's very simple. I've actually simplified it a little bit from the recipe book that I got it from. Um, but what we have here is just some simple ingredients. And the core of the ingredients start with our red lentils. And I use Bob's Red Mill brand, but you can use whatever brand that you can get a hold of at your local store. And what I love about red lentils is they're a great source of plant protein, high in fiber. They've got important nutrients like potassium, folic acid. They're, they're a real nutrition powerhouse and a great um, center of a plant-based meal. The other ingredients in the soup are onions, a red tomato, some carrots, a little bit of lemon juice. We also have some low sodium broth, extra virgin olive oil, and some spices. We've got cumin, coriander, red pepper flakes, which are optional, but I like to throw them in there for a nice little tang and spice, and a little bit of salt and pepper. And of course, salt is always optional as well. So before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about the cancer-fighting ingredients in here. We have red tomatoes, and that red is lycopene, and lycopene is an excellent antioxidant. We have beta carotene in our orange carrots, and again, they're a great source of antioxidant power. And of course, onions and the family of vegetables, the allium vegetables like onions, garlic, uh, shallots, they are also a really good cancer fighter. Onions are also a great source of quercetin, which again is an antioxidant. So you got a lot of really great ingredients in here. So this recipe is really easy. Um, what we'll be doing is I'll have chopped up the onion, chopped up one tomato, chopped up one carrot. Sometimes I do two because I kind of like that texture in there. The juice, half a lemon. And then we're going to take a cup of red lentils. They should be rinsed in a colander before you use them. So I'll have done that. And then we'll get started on putting our soup together. So follow me. Okay, so I've taken the one onion and I've chopped it up. And I put a little olive oil in the pan here. And I've been kind of cooking them for the last five minutes or so. Um, the idea is to cook long enough that they become a little bit opaque. Um, actually, one thing is to come off, maybe. So, I'm going ready to be our next step in this recipe. It's pretty good here. And I certainly smell delicious. Love that. Okay, so once you have your onions sauteed and they're a little bit on the opaque side, then I take the um, spices that were in the recipe. So what I have here is I have one teaspoon of ground cumin, um, half a teaspoon of ground coriander, and I don't know, I guess a, a dash or maybe a quarter teaspoon of those red pepper flakes, but you can use as much or as little as you like. So I'm going to toss that in with our onion and give it a little, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds. Um, stir. You can begin to smell those wonderful spices. Fill up your kitchen with some really uh, yummy smells. All right. Now that we've got that in there, let's go for a couple seconds. is where we add rest of, you know, almost all the ingredients. So what we have is we're going to add our chopped carrot, our chopped tomato, I have taken one cup of the red lentils, I rinsed them in this colander, and I'm going to dump those in there now. And then we kind of take a big blob that you have to break up. Fun part about this recipe. And then we're going to take our broth. We're going to use all of this. Mix it up. Stay in. Leave it all in there. And then I'll just try to break up the big glob there of lentils. Eventually they break apart once they get cooking. Stir those together here. 
But basically, I've added all the ingredients that we need for the this part of the stage of preparation. Um, as I said, I just tried to drink, break up some of those lentils as I eventually bubble it up. So we've got our onion, our spices, we've got carrot, tomato, the broth, um, and we're in lentils, and we're gonna just let this begin to simmer. So I have it on about medium high heat. Uh, what you want to do is bring it to a boil and then for a simmer and then turn it down maybe a little bit medium medium temperature is pretty good or medium low and put your lid on and we let it go and it cooks for about 35 minutes what you're looking for is those red lentils to get soft um, and they'll absorb everything else in there um, so we're gonna let this go for a little bit and we'll come back when it's closer to being done. All right, so we're back and this has been simmering for about 30 minutes. So I'm going to stir this up. As you can see, everything's looking really good. Um, the lentils are fully cooked. We have chunks of carrot, tomato. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much done with a, just a few little add-ons here. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the heat off. And this is where you can take um, your lemon. I've juiced my half a lemon in my little juicer here. And I'm going to pour the little lemon juice in here now. So stir that up. And there we go. Adds a little bit of brightness to it. We don't want to forget that little duck. And then as I said, you can feel free to season it as you like. A little bit of salt and pepper at this point to taste just fine. We're starting to fresh pepper. Stir it up. And there we go. Beautiful lentil soup. I'll come back and show you what the final product looks like. Um, but this is pretty much close to it. And what I do is I will put it in my mason jars and um, this will make probably a good two to three um, meals for two people. Um, so please enjoy. All right, thanks. All right, so everybody can hopefully still hear me now. I don't have my headphones on. Um, but thanks for uh, watching that video. So as you can see, that beautiful red lentil soup in my bowl here. If anybody's interested in the recipe, feel free to email me at pamela.riggs at mymarinhealth.org and I can send that to you. As I said, it's super easy and it's super delicious. And this time of year, it's a great option um, and really helps us get our plant forward diet into play. Um, and it's a great source of fiber and plant protein. Um, so please enjoy that. and. Uh, to complement something like that, you know, a nice, beautiful kale, butternut, squash, pomegranate, pumpkin seed salad is a great option. Um, my coworker, Janine, found this wonderful recipe at Epicurious, so uh, check that out. But what a great, beautiful, colorful plant-based meal that's not only delicious, but very nutritious. So I um, hope you all enjoy uh, those meal ideas. All right, so we're winding things down here. And really, if you can take any messages with you today um, is to remember that the idea here for a long and healthy life and an anti-cancer diet, anti-inflammatory diet, it's gonna be good for cancer prevention as well, um, is to choose again, more plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, right? Um, consume those healthier fats, um, high in omega-3s uh, from fish or flax, chia, walnuts, um, want to get a variety of monounsaturated fats from like olive oil, canola oil, avocados. Um, so uh, focusing on those things, you know, trying to minimize the added sugars. Um, we don't want uh, a lot of simple sugars that are bouncing our blood sugar up and producing more insulin and insulin again, is kind of a fat storing hormone and is contributing to um, insulin growth like factors that are linked to a number of cancers. That lean, healthy, high quality protein that Janine so nicely talked about 
Um, and we didn't spend too much time on alcohol, but again, alcohol in moderation, we do know with some specific cancers, especially breast cancer, alcohol intake, even in moderation, which would be like a glass a day, um, does increase the risk of breast cancer. So we really wanna be mindful of that. And women who have had breast cancer, who still wanna enjoy an occasional alcoholic beverages or really recommend probably no more than one to two um, servings over a week's period of time, less is always better. And of course we wanna maintain a healthy weight, right? Um, because of the link between obesity and um, certain types of cancers, as well as heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and joint issues. So um, really that's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I hope that this has been um, really helpful uh, to you today so that you can um, take everything that we talked about and actually implement those uh, shopping tips and meal ideas and experiment with some new recipes. And we really um, welcome everybody for being here uh, and appreciate your time.